the Welfare Reform and Social Investment Policy in Europe and East Asia. And I got this, uh, the PPT slide from Police Press, and uh, we have a 50% discount. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's promotion. Ah, Antonio so has shown that he has already a volume of a book. Thank right. you very much. <laughs> Even before the discount applies. Oh. It's a good book. It's a good book. Thank Thank you. You. Yes. <laughs> That's what friend for, right? <laughs> it's a good book for everybody. So I definitely recommend it. Mm -hmm. Timo Sion, are you here? Okay, probably not yet. Uh, hmm. Sonia, could you text them? <laughs> whether they're because sometimes they they misunderstand the time is always tricky so. I, i'll text them I, yeah i mean it's, it's yeah i'll text them now hang on <laughs> i'll stop here good evening Oh, oh hi. Okay. Yes, Simon. Yes, you're here. Sorry, look in, look in was more troublesome than anticipated. <laughs> okay. Are you well? Yeah. I think the people. Yeah, yeah, I think people are coming in. Uh, shall we wait one more minute? We'll start uh, nine or four, uh, eight or four in Hong Kong time. My time is nine or four. And probably what time is it in London? It's uh, one of one. One of four. Yeah. Okay. Right. Lunch time. <laughs> Lunch time. Have you? Yeah, <laughs> just about. <laughs> Great. Actually, we have a drink session uh, after this session. Uh, if you go to the the special chat. Um, Supposed to come with a uh, beer and uh, any drink. Oh. But I'm not sure whether it's a uh, 1 p.m. 2 p.m. is good good time for drink beer, but but you know please join afterwards. Uh, we have a special chat. It's a virtual space for meeting people. Uh, the rule is simply uh, bring your drink. Okay. So uh, if you look at the booklet and there is a uh, the link, but I will also share the link in the the chat room. Okay, so uh, it seems everybody is here, so uh, let's start. Uh, welcome to our book lunch seminar, uh, the Welfare Reform Social Investment Policy in Europe and East Asia. And this is the book, and it seems Antonio has already got one, and several people <laughs> got already their one uh, book. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Young Jun Chair, Yonsei University. Uh, purpose of this panel session is, uh, on the one hand, to be honest, uh, to promote uh, this book and also talk about, uh, you know, this book. And also, uh, we also want to discuss the future of uh, key issue and future of social investment and how to redesign social investment for responding to changes and challenges we are experiencing. So um, the first the session, uh, we have about a 75 minutes uh, or so. So our uh, first Timo and Suyan, co-editor of this volume with me, uh, will introduce this book. Then uh, Ijin and Jian will talk about family policy and gender equality in East Asia and Europe. After that, Sonia will uh, talk about education and social investment, focusing on education spending. And uh, finally, I will discuss how to upgrade social investment strategy in future, uh, basically uh, throw out some questions and we'll hope to uh, discuss with you. Um, oh, and then we welcome your question and comments. Uh, each presentation should be about 10, uh, should be about 10 minutes uh, or less, then we would have enough time for discussion afterward. Uh, so, uh, Timo and Suyan, shall you? Yeah. Yes, let me share the screen. Yeah. And, um, yeah. can you all see our slide? Yes. Very okay. well. Great. Yeah, okay, let me get started. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on our book launch from wherever you are in the world. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce this book to you, Welfare Reform and Social Investment, a 
policy in Europe and East Asia, it is by far one of my most enjoyable um, collaborations, the product of most enjoyable collaborations between scholars based in the UK and East Asia. We are very honored to have strong endorsements from great scholars such as Evelyn Huber, Neil Gilbert, and of course, Yeom Myung Kim, who's a great scholar uh, looking into East Asia and also South Korean social policy, but who has been also deeply involved in social policy making in the current Moon Jae-in South Korean government. So in our presentation, in the first half, I will introduce the foundations of the book. And then in the second half, Timo will zoom into chapters and introduce key themes running throughout the book. Then why social investment policy? Hemorrhaic argued that there's been a quiet paradigm revolution. Across the OECD world, we have been observing a comprehensive changes in education, family, and labor market policy. And these changes have been typically discussed in the context of new social risk. But these changes happened at very different speeds and to very different extents. So in this book, we argue that there is non-linear development towards greater social investment. In this book, we review social policy, um, social investment policy developments in Europe and East Asia with a view to assess the roads as well as barriers towards <coughs> effective social investment policy. And in this book, we make a case towards effective social investment policy, we make a case for integrated welfare reform, combining social investments and social protection. Of course, the importance of combining social investment with protection has been well argued by scholars, but in this book, we also emphasize the importance of labor market regulation in institutions, including more attention for the workplace culture and practices. Why? Because we argue that it is important to acknowledge institutional complementarity. So when we design social investment strategies, we should consider, um, we should consider social protection and existing labor market regulations and practices in designing effective uh, social investment strategies to fully achieve the intended effect. And Timo will pick up on this point and the importance of uh, institutional complementarity, especially the need to consider labor market regulation and institutions in designing social investment um, strategies and later on in this part of presentation. In our book, we adopt a life course approach. Why life course approach? Because capacity and learning in any one stage must be seen in connection with what happened earlier and what is to happen. And what happened in one stage affects one's social mobility and well being the next stage. So, to do full justice to um, life course approach, in this book, we cover a wide range of policy domains and issues ranging from starting with early childhood education and care, and then moving on to school-age children, schools and private tutoring, then moving on to university um, students, higher education and employability. And then we look into working age population through, through training and skills policy, work family policy. Then we conclude by looking at grandparenting and active aging, as long as long-term social care. And in this book, we analyze policy and politics in tandem. For policy, we analyze course policy substance. We also assess capacity for greater social investment and policy outcome. But also we examine politics to identify roles and barriers. And ultimately, what are the political conditions 
that lead to greater social investment. So we identify pathways into greater social investment and equality in this book. And our book is based on methodological pluralism. So including, we included qualitative as well as quantitative methods. For qualitative methods here, um, some examples are, so we, may, we mainly uh, employed document analysis as well as process tracing techniques for qualitative methods. And some examples are Sam Himobart and Song Hili's chapter looked into work family expansion and idea of social investment. And Nicola Duras's chapter on employability, higher education, and the knowledge economy. And Juha Lee's chapter on the governance of social investment in comparative perspective. For quantitative methods, in Kaun Ban, his chapter, he did formal modeling to estimate human capital depreciation, followed by econometrics analysis using OECD PIAC data. And also Cheyong Pa did time series analysis in his chapter, testing the Matthew effect of social investment policies. And in Mi Young An, in her chapter, she did a multi-level modeling analysis of the gender division of housework using ISSP data. Before I hand over this presentation to Timo, let me briefly tell you why Europe and East Asia comparison is important. So why does it matter? Methodologically, it offers most different research design. So we compare policy developments across very different welfare regimes and regions. Yet, we observe very similar developments in both regions and it provides a greater number of empirical observations. Also in doing so, we investigate not only success, but also failure in both regions, Europe and East Asia. And it allows the study of social investment policies in very different political and economic contexts. So it opens up opportunities for better <coughs> understanding of policy developments, but also lesson drawing to improve social policy making based on experiences of both regions, Europe and East Asia. Now over to you, Timo. Okay, okay. Um, in the second half, I want to highlight um, um, one of the some of the key themes and key key findings. So, in the publisher's language, the unique selling points. Um, and um, I try to make reference to to a few chapters throughout. We have twelve chapters in in the book, so I won't be able to do full justice. But um, later on, um, the other presenters will pick up more materials. So, apologies if I don't quite manage to to get all squeezed in. One of the first unique selling points of the book, I think, is that we look at private social, social investment, which I think is a big blind spot in the social investment literature. In social protection, social security, we talk a lot about private um, um, insurances, think about pensions, or think about social care, marketized elder care is a big, big theme in the literature. So it is quite puzzling that the private dimension of social investment isn't really looked at, even though it features very prominently from early on, early education, um, certainly is when parents start to invest. Um, Sonia's work, and Sonia will talk about it later um, more, looked at private tutoring, um, its prominence not only in East Asia, but increasingly also in, in Europe. And Yongjun's chapter um, shows really that private social investment is a very powerful mechanism to, to reinforce existing um, inequalities. Inequalities that continues um, in higher education. And here we have Nicolo looking at um, higher education reform, employability, and then how different educational systems, depending on the public-private mix to a certain extent, then um, deliver education differently. So here, a big, big theme a very important theme we believe in in our our book. The second big theme, and that is where where Yong Jun will zoom in um, um, towards the end of this session, is labor market dualization. So here, the polarization between 
insiders and, and outsiders. Um, essentially, to use plainer language, the emergence of the winner takes it all labor market, where a few are very successful and many then lose out and, um, well, work um, in jobs like uh, McDonald's. Um, so here, this dualization, the polarization, the increasingly um, stronger perception of insecurity throughout your life course, actually, driving, first of all, the private education investment, Sonia will um, um, talk about more, but then also undermine social investment policies um, at working age. So here, Ejin and Jiun um, will look at labor market dualization in the, and then the big theme of, of gender, how gender inequalities in the labor market really undermine the effectiveness of social investment policies. And um, um, we have one chapter um, on um, grandparenting, which I think is a really great one because it shows how um, even those who aren't in the labor market anymore are affected by dualization. So basically grandparents absorbing the pressure from their children when looking after their grandparenting, grandchildren, and how this grandparenting in dualized labor markets really undermines the well-being um, of the elderly and then compromises active aging to which grandparenting should actually contribute because grandparenting can make you happy, happier, um, but not necessarily um, if you do it in a terribly dualized labor market. Here our um, findings echo the need for um, earlier research um, at, um, um, calling for a more egalitarian social structure in order to make the most out of social investment policy. So Bea Cantillo, Gianni Bonoli, think about Barbier. So, um, but I think we go beyond that, emphasizing the labor market dimension. The labor market dimension, not only in terms of the macro institution, my following side, you see I have to rush a lot, um, but also the workplace which I think features very prominently in our book too, and is an important dimension. The workplace compromising the implementation of social investment policies. So again, each and June's um, chapter um, on gender and dualization is important, but also I think an example to highlight the theme would be Gawain Spahn's um, chapter on skills depreciation, where he shows the importance of workplace cultures. And there is little point to invest into education and skills throughout the life course if the labor market, if the workplace is just not able to utilize those skills. So here, just a kind of supply side policy of, of skills and investing more um, might not be great. So again, we believe this makes a case for labor market regulation to change in workplace practices um, for better skills use, for more effective social investment, but also for more gender egalitarian outcomes. Higher education to return to Nicolo's um, um, chapter, um, which I think is um, very useful for us in the book because it also highlights um, um, well, the importance of production regimes and highlights that policies um, aren't working equally, equally well across um, spaces. So the theme of different institutional contexts need to be considered. And Nicolo shows, I think really well, that higher education policies that work well in the high end service sector economy, for instance, maybe don't quite work well in a manufacturing based economy. So here, um, the theme of complementarity um, can be um, illustrated. So from policy to politics, um, I would like to kick off with um, Sam Himmelweitz and Sangi Lee's chapter on ideas, which I think is a beautiful chapter. It's beautiful because it shows that actually ideas can make a difference and ideas can be used really well in a smart way to create cross-class coalition. And they pick up the last um, idea of um, coalition um, magnet and here how to mobilize around an innovative ideas, idea. And it seems, I think the book suggests that this is easier in family policy. And also um, Suchens and my work kind of combining the ideational um, notion with 
um, the electoral incentives shows that here innovation is possible. We are possibly a bit more pessimistic when we look at the labor market, where a lot of the big, big problems um, remain. And here, um, it seems that employers are more difficult to, to mobilize. And I think um, here we, uh, we show how when organized labor, for instance, with reference to the Italian case, when organized labor is committed to social investment, that they can push employers to, towards it. So there are conditions for more inclusive coalitions, also in labor market policy, but it suggests that it's more difficult. Last slide um, um, for us, um, COVID-19. COVID-19 we didn't cover in the book, so the chapters were already done with the publisher when COVID um, hit. Um, but you think COVID should be picked up here as well, because what I think COVID has shown is, um, well, essentially the COVID crisis exposed weaknesses and fault lines in existing welfare settlements, in welfare regimes, with regards to, to the lack of adequate social protection buffers, but also the inadequacy of labor market um, regulation, ex exposing outsiders to really sometimes really huge, huge risks. So these risks we talk about um, in the book at different stages, I think they got amplified and really exposed quite a lot during COVID-19. And I think what we can, can hope for that the experimenting, social policy experimenting that has been taken place across well, the OECD essentially, countries had to respond rapidly to this exodus shock of COVID-19, that this will be then combined with more experimenting in social investment policies and here that hopefully the crisis will ultimately in result, positive mindset right now, in more inclusive policies in the future too, which then would also um, um, or should um, improve the effectiveness of those policies um, in the social investment domain. That is us, but Yongjun mentioned the book can be bought. Those of you who haven't bought it yet, um, and you're an environmentally um, conscious person, you can get an e-copy of that book if you um, and get it half price using policy presses um, um, conference um, um, code. So those of you who think about maybe use it in teaching or also in their research, um, use that code and you get it a bit cheaper. Now back to, to Yongjun. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Sion and Timo. Yeah, I, I have to say, you know, th they are living together. <laughs> so no surprise. Yeah, we have a house share. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the Suyan and Timo nicely and explain very well about the key and distinctive feature of the book. And then we'll go to more like details of the, the book, the part. Uh, Ijin and Jin, next uh, 10 minutes, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will start and I like to share the screen. Um, mm -mm. um sorry, this is not the one. Uh um sorry, um okay. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay. Um, good afternoon from Germany. Um, my name is Jin Li. And as Timo and Suyan argued, we like to add some nuance as to why social investment policy studies in a broader comparative perspectives matter. Um, there are a few topics in comparative social policy literature that by no means are exclusively related to European welfare states only. So take the example of families based on the male breadwinner model. Um, in traditional male bread model, women are expected to be more primary caregivers and thus they have more work family reconciliation issues and high level of gender inequality in labor market. Um, this is also the case of the East Asia, 
Korea and Japan, for example. So therefore, social investment approach can be an important measure to alleviate the problem by improving women's employment and making transitions from career interruptions. Um, and this issue has become even more critical now due to the pandemic, um, as Timo said. Um, women are affected by unemployment more than men for two reasons. First of all, um, employment sector. Um, women tend to work more in retail, tourism, and the restaurant sector. And the second and maybe even more important reasons are the school closer. Um, school closed, nursery closed, everything was closed. Um, and that leads to increased childcare needs and the burden tend to fall on to women. That is affecting women's ability to work, um, leading to persistent earning losses even years later. Also, according to the recent research at um, Cambridge University, women are providing six hours of childcare and homeschooling, um, two hours more than their male partner, regardless of their employment status. So gender inequality is now an even more important issue. And in the published book, we address the question, does social investment actually improve female employment um, during individuals' life course. Our book was written um, before the pandemic, but we believe um, this subject is very timely to consider under the current situation. So um, for our research, we compared four countries, Korea, Japan, and Italy, Spain, because they share many similarities in their traditional familialistic culture, which stress caregiving responsibility for women. Um, also, their public expenditure in family policy is relatively limited. But at the same time, they are also different in the degree of commitment to social investment reform. And, and actually, it is the starting point of our research, the puzzle about the relationship between um, the commitment to social investment policy and the labor market and flow. Um, as Izin will explain in details later, four countries have shown different degree of commitment to family policy. For example, South Korea is the most decisive path shifter in investing in family policy, but Italy was the most reluctant to push the reforms, and Japan and Spain um, fall somewhere between. So according to the implicit assumptions of social investment approach, we might expect the biggest improvement in female employment in Korea and the modest improvement in Italy. But it was not the case. As you can see the slides, um, Spain and Japan showed the best improvements, then Italy followed, and then Korea. So increasing social investment does not result linearly in a better labor market flow. So how puzzling it is. Um, what then improves women's employment prospect during the course of these continuous careers, apart from social investment reforms itself? Um, Izin and I argue um, other factors could be significant as the reform itself, and Izin will talk about it in details. Thank you, Jun. Uh, do you think you can move to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, uh, I'm uh, very happy to be here to um, speak more about what we were thinking about, what we're, we're coming up with when it comes about this book, because uh, what, as uh, Jun was saying before, uh, the topic of uh, male breadwinner families and uh, familialization and uh, women's participation to the labor market and uh, um, uh, um, having a higher gender responsibilities uh, for having higher care responsibilities that are gendered, which means uh, having a bigger role for women, either when they are working or they are taking care of their families, they have a harder time with reconciliation, right? So all these things, are very widely discussed 
both in European terms and in Asian terms, but the two worlds are not really coming together very often. So I think that this book is a very rare occasion for helping us to put these two uh, discussions together and to try and make sense of what is happening. Because if you think about this, the problematic parts are the same. If you look at the four countries that we are considering, they all are affected by having, generally speaking, low levels of women's participation to the labor market, with the partial exception of Japan, which tends to have a relatively not so low participation of women to the labor market. Nevertheless, it is uh, still problematic in the sense that women tend to work, especially in part-time work. So there is a problem in there. There is a problem in, in our chapter, we are mainly trying to look at this problem in terms of women's labor market participation, but it's quite a simple measurement, right? So what we try to do is to consider not only the participation per se, but focusing on a more social investment oriented perspective. We tried to look at what Anton Hemmerich is famously calling the labor market flow which is one of the main functions of social investments. And it is meant to mean not only labor market participation, so having employment, but also uh, being employed throughout the life course, which uh, is something that in our chapter, we tried to divide in different phases. Now, as everybody knows here in male breadwinners, family-oriented societies, the participation to the labor market for women tends to be somehow a secondary affair, right? In the sense that it is quite obvious that if they participate to the labor market, it's just as something that, uh, you know, is not considered necessary because the, the bread win winner is the man, right? And this is something that traditionally speaking has been common in all of these four familialistic countries, right? So if we want to see how the labor market flow works, especially for female employment, we can notice that one big problem that affects women when they participate to the labor market is the career interruption they experience when they are experiencing motherhood and the child rearing. So we are distinguishing here four distinct phases to the labor market flow on female labor market participation. On the first instance, we have the entering the labor market part. Now, this is a little bit problematic for countries like Italy, Spain, Japan, because it tends to be quite slow. Uh, whereas in the case of South Korea, women are somehow even more advantaged in entering the labor market in comparison to men, because I don't know if you guys know about this, but Korean men have to endure two years of military service. <laughs> so women somehow are starting to work even sooner than men. And this is usually not too much unmatched with uh, um, their uh, skills, right? So entering the labor market in South Korea is quite good. And uh, the social West investment reform in South Korea has been very substantial, especially when it comes about expansion of universal childcare services. So in, according to these four countries, Korea has been the most spectacularly investing country with a state, right, in this respect. And the interest to the labor market is quite smooth. Then problems start to emerge when it comes about the continuation in the life cycle of the working career of the women. So one very big problem that both Korea and Japan experience is what is called the M shape of labor market participation. This means that when we consider the working life of, of women in these two countries, you can see that at the time in which they have child rearing age, right? Especially in late twenties, early thirties, until the mid thirties, there is this kind of dip in the labor market participation, which kind of resembles an M. So this M shape in sociology is considered to be a very bad problem when it comes about career interruptions. And when we were graphing this in the chapter, we can clearly see that differently from Italy and Spain, they tend to have generally speaking, lower levels of labor market participation. Japan and South Korea have this dip that looks like an M. So this is a problem that is noticeable in both countries. So the third problem would be then how to re-enter the labor market. So when we're looking at the age, we will see that re-entering the labor market is a problem for women, especially in the mid to late thirties, early forties, right? And this is something that uh, is not working very well, even if these heavily social investors, such as South Korea, 
because re-entering the labour market at the previous conditions with the same job is very difficult. So usually what happens is that you tend to re-enter the labour market at the worst conditions. This is something that we can see, we can notice as being pretty dire a situation, especially in Korea, but this is noticeable in Japan too, because even when they re-enter the labour market, they are not committed as they could have been before, they, it's very likely that they are actually working part time. Whereas in the case of Italy and Spain, the overall participation to the labour market is lower. In Spain, it has improved a little bit. In Italy, it's definitely lower, but uh, the, the line, the continuation of work ac across different ages tends to be quite smooth, less dips in, in the shape of M, so to say. And when it comes about the latest stages of employment in mid-age, right, so in the 40s, in the 50s, the mid-life employment, uh, the situation tended to be quite bad in Italy and Spain, but it is slowly improving. In the case of Japan and Korea, it is kept at acceptable levels. So the most critical part is actually this middle part, right? Uh, career interruptions and secondly, re-entering the labor market. And these two problems tend to be especially noticeable in Japan and South Korea. But the interesting thing here is that generally speaking, labor market participation rate, rates have improved especially in Spain and Japan. So if you think about this, this is somehow breaking the traditional welfare regime theory of Esping Anderson, because we might want to, to classify Italy and Spain among the Mediterranean welfare states, Southern welfare states, and Japan and South Korea among East Asian welfare states. However, uh, the differences are somehow crossing, uh, going across traditional welfare regime expectations. So uh, the main finding of our chapter was the fact that what is visible, what is available in terms of jobs, in terms of quality jobs, um, uh, could make a difference. And actually, when we say that the biggest improvements in terms of employment rates were observed in Spain and Japan, this is also something that we can observe in the dual labor market structure in the sense that both Spain and Japan have made some degree of flexibilization of the labor markets much more than is the case in Italy and Korea. So because in Italy and Korea, the labor market tends to be more rigid, then maybe this itself is creating different working opportunities, although whether this is going to be uh, a good job or not a very good job is a matter of contention. And another thing that we could notice is that uh, a gender equality culture might also play a role here. Maybe we need to have further research that is looking at the labor market structure and the gender equality culture uh, combined, because as of now, it looks as if Japan and South Korea are much more conservative than Italy and Spain, although all of them are familialistic. Nevertheless, we have considered this to be an important element to consider too. We also had other controlling elements such as the policy legacy, such as the socioeconomic conditions. As we all know, uh, the especially the 2008 economic crisis has been especially harsh for Southern European countries and austerity policies have been some, somehow the norm in South, Southern European countries. Uh, whereas uh, Japan had something that maybe in comparison we can call the high public debt which is somehow constraining more the action of the government. And in Korea, the policy legacy and the socioeconomic conditions tended to be more favorable. So if we look at the whole picture, South Korea has a strong social investment policy reform. It has a smooth labor market entrance for women. It has high levels of skills. It has um, uh, a, a, a less burdensome uh, inheritance in terms of policy legacy, socioeconomic conditions, yet, women's labor market participation rates were not improving as much. So this is something that um, needs definitely more um, perspective through uh, comparative research. I think that generally speaking, our book is very much researched, like uh, differently from many other books. This book has a lot of research, a lot of empirical data, a lot of methodology. And we hope that in this way, we were able to make a contribution uh, to this discussion. Uh, generally speaking, I think that there are many ways in which the book makes contributions to add nuance to how social investment policies actually work, depending on the context, depending on uh, which other policies they're combined with. So I would like to end the presentation here to give more space to the other presenters to give more details about this very interesting project that we have made. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you very much, uh, Jean and Ejin, uh, for your presentation about the family policy and gender. Uh, there are so many interesting kind of comparison and also kind of puzzles still we have. Okay, the next is Sonia, please. Okay, I, I, I think you need to stop screen sharing so I can screen thanks. Cheers. Okay, I will. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah, okay, good, I'll just do that. Back. Okay, uh, so hi, I'm Sonia Exley, for, for anybody who doesn't know me, which would be most of you probably. Um, I, uh, I was one of the chapter authors. I'm really pleased to be here talking to you today. Um, so I was covering a lot to do with education in my chapter. Um, the question I was looking at really was, um, how far is a focus on public spending in uh, social investment policy? How far is it enough? And I've kind of provocatively argued in my title, is it a rather limited approach? So um, what I'm gonna say, I'm, not, I'm gonna go into depth in the findings of the chapter. I'm gonna draw out some overarching themes really of what I said. So um, the first thing is that we know from years of literature on social investment now that one of its central planks has long been this focus on public education spending, the huge importance of this at all levels of education, right from the early years, like in that diagram that shows you know, children, zero to five, right through to adult learning. Um, and this spending has of course been seen as being vastly important uh, in terms of boosting knowledge economies, but also for equalizing opportunities in society, for preventing talent from being wasted, particularly among disadvantaged groups. Um, so this is all seen as being very important, and of course it is. Um, but one fact that's very much happening in parallel um, with families all over the world is that they are of course very often also at the same time spending privately on their children's education. Uh, so not just paying for private schools out and out, uh, but also goods and services, they're paying growing amounts for services like private supplementary tutoring on top of public education. And one important dynamic that this can create, I would argue, is that even as governments are with their social investment strategies, they are trying to expand public education opportunities, particularly for disadvantaged groups, middle class and more affluent families, particularly in societies that are highly unequal, um, they're very often motivated uh, to try and stay sort of one step ahead of the game in terms of their own children. Um, so paying a little bit extra in order to pre preserve the competitive advantage. Um, this is often described as maintaining inequalities, even as uh, public education expands. And in many societies that can then lead to ratcheting private education costs for families. Um, people, are, people are spending more and more, but at the same time, they're not necessarily doing very much to alter their relative positioning in the education and labor market pecking order, if you like. Um, now, that's not to say that it's, it's not still important to invest in public education. Of course it is, and indeed possibly private education spending too is, is very important. Um, and absolute levels, so absolute levels of education in a society, they certainly still matter, even if there are questions over how far that spending can um, specifically help us to narrow inequalities. Though, so, and here I would also want to point to Niccolo Durazzi's chapter in our book, uh, which is all about how well or otherwise different skills regimes, different systems and configurations of education and training institutions in our societies are aligned with different sorts of knowledge economy, the labor market needs of employers. In short, sometimes these are well matched, sometimes they can be quite severely mismatched. Um, so absolute levels of education spending, whether they're public or they're private, they do also have to be the right kind of education spending um, if they're going to boost growth, assuming we uh, think growth is important, which is another question in itself. Okay, so building on those kind of introductory themes, uh, in my chapter, I was looking at the rise of private supplementary tutoring or shadow education, as it's often called. Um, 
of course, this has been a phenomenon uh, which has become really very entrenched in most parts of East Asia um, in, in over several decades. Though very interestingly, more recently, that rise has been happening substantially right across the West and most major regions of the world, actually. Um, in London, where I am unfortunately sitting right now because it is pouring with rain, um, they, uh, even, even before the pandemic, we were in a situation where 40% of kids in London at some point in their school career are now um, receiving private tutoring at some point. Um, there's been a huge increase in the past 10 years, and that's not even taking into account what's, what's happened in the last year and a half or so. Uh, uh, in my chapter, I was looking particularly at the South Korean experience. I, I did some field work in South Korea, went and interviewed policymakers and stakeholders in Korea. And, um, and really, they were, I was looking at the theme was some um, difficulties that South Korean policymakers have experienced, all sorts of different types of policy attempts to regulate and to curb families' demand for shadow education. Korea, of course, famous for its, its hagwons, uh, more than 100,000 of those in the country, but um, also many other types of private tutoring happening there too. It's long been a country with, um, you know, some of the highest spending on this in the world. I feel like I'm teaching grandmothers to suck eggs here. Of course, you, you know this, you know, many of you are in South Korea right now. Um, and of course, it's caused major problems for society, edu poverty, as they call it, among many families. Um, and what struck me about the Korean experience is just how little difference um, all the policy efforts have actually made to manage to curb families' demand for this shadow education. Um, and actually sometimes even driving it further, sometimes inadvertently increasing demand in various ways rather than reducing it. Um, that seems to have been particularly driven since the 1990s. Uh, by patterns of growing inequality and growing labor market dualism in the country. Extreme competition for not just places at universities, but places in the very top universities getting more and more um, in order for people to get jobs with um, the top employers. Um, since the book was written, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you, there has been a global pandemic. Um, children have spent vast amounts of time outside of school learning at home. Uh, and of course, that's got implications for private tutoring, uh, the, the full implications in terms of families likely changing patterns of demand for private tutoring, um, conditioning of new habits in terms of what families are going to do and the implications of that for inequality, given obviously families have radically unequal capacities to spend on this. Uh, they're not yet known. The implications are not yet known in research terms. It's too soon. Uh, to know, but they are likely to be very big. Um, in England right now, government, uh, the, the government we have at the moment is introducing policies where small amounts of private tutoring are being subsidised for less advantaged students. Um, however, there are, given the themes I've just said, I've just outlined, there are questions to be asked about how far that there are limits to that kind of approach when for one thing, this contributes to a further normalizing of shadow education in society, a further entrenching. Um, and as I've said, affluent families can always spend more. They have incentives in unequal societies to try and maintain the inequalities, even where poorer families are going to receive some private tutoring, be it government subsidized or through their own means as far as they can. So, what can be done? Um, I'm not very optimistic, I'll try. Um, so I, I think in the chapter I argue in terms of policy implications that are pessimistically, I think there are very much limits to what education policy can do on its own. That's not to say I don't think it's important, I just think it's not enough on its own by any stretch. Um, it matters, but it can't eliminate inequalities on its own. Um, the experiences in South Korea over several decades, they've taught us not only that it's very difficult um, to restrict parental freedoms to spend on shadow education, where there's a will, there is a way, parents will find ways to do it. Um, it's also possibly undesirable uh, for parents' negative liberties to tell them what they can and can't spend money on for their own children. Um, at the same time, 
governments really, I would argue, they're ignoring this, certainly in the West, they're ignoring this rising demand at their own peril and at the peril of societies um, and how expensive this could all become for the average family. Policies, for example, in France, um, also recently in Sweden, we've seen uh, tax relief uh, for private tutoring. These are policies that are at, not just not discouraging, but they're actively encouraging demand for private tutoring. Um, and I think governments need to be paying much more attention to that, but also to the bigger underlying reasons. Why are families doing this in the first place? Why are they spending all this money? And in the chapter, this is linking to what uh, Timo said as well about, um, about wider connections to other parts of policy. Um, I argue that families are anxious. They are anxious about uncertain futures. Um, inequalities in the world have grown. Employee protections are becoming fewer and fewer. Welfare states are transforming and retrenching in lots of different ways, um, while they may be expanding in others. There is a fear of falling. Um, and private education spending, I think for many families in a time of knowledge economies, is it's seen as being a form of sort of uh, at least a way to try and ensure against those uncertain futures, um, effective though it may or may not be. So my real conclusion is just that education policy on its own is very much not enough. Um, I think it must always be considered in tandem with social protection policy, with taxation policy, with labour market policy, all the reasons that are making families anxious in the first place that drive them to spend on education policy and, and more and more private spending for their kids. So a joined up approach, um, however realistic or otherwise that may be, um, is what I would very much advocate and it's the argument that's underpinning my chapter. Um, I don't know if I've spoken for 10 minutes or less, but, uh, <laughs> but I, will, I will end there. Yeah, great. Um, you know, Sonia spent a lot of time in Daejeon. It's a heart of uh, shadow education in Korea. Uh, so she knew, know a lot more than me about Korean shadow education. So I know <laughs> why she she is so pessimistic about uh, the prospect of right. the social investment issue. Um, yeah, you should try and be more positive. My students hate it. So. <laughs> So yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's a very difficult to be uh, actually optimistic about the future, and uncertainty is definitely is all around. So uh, so final is is mine. Um, yeah. So how to? Uh, I I don't know. I I don't have the uh, I the kind of full idea, but I, I'll just simply share about the, some of the idea uh, what to do further. Um, you know, the class divide has been deepened even further during COVID-19 and strict social distancing and lockdown can be even an opportunity for some of us, uh, particularly academics, uh, because we can stay home and take care of kids and, you know, we can easily change our work from offline to online, but most of people, they actually suffer. Uh, so we're, you know, we're living in knowledge economy, knowledge society, but it seems knowledge alone could not save people from the hardship. That's what uh, we see. And inequality and dualization further weaken uh, the social mobility. Um, in chapter four in our book, uh, Yunyong and I analyzed the panel data, which traced 6,000 students over 10 years in Korea. Uh, we could see the effect of parents' background on student SAT score, sunung jamsu, and their early labor market income. Uh, we paid particular attention to shadow education and self-study time as a mediating factor. Uh, though Korea has been once uh, praised as one of the uh, societies with very high mobile, uh, social mo high social mobility, but it, it was clear that a parents' background strongly influenced not only shared education, but also self-study time. And uh, shared education and self-study time was strongly associated with SAT score, which also affect uh, positively labor market income. So uh, even uh, in recent survey I did with my colleague shows that COVID-19 even strengthened the dualized pattern of shared education and student performance even further. It is becoming a significant issue. But the problem does not end there. Uh, if Korea produced many high-performing students, according to PISA, even if we, we produce many high-performing students, uh, there are institutional and structural problems in universities and labor market, which result in labor market mismatch 
and on the utilization of human capital, uh, the team already explained. In chapter five, uh, the Niccolo Durazzi, uh, Niccolo, the splendid chapter, uh, he questioned why employer satisfaction in Korea and East Asia is particularly low compared to Western countries. As you see here, uh, we have a lot of problems. Uh, a knowledge-based labor market. Uh, he found a problem in Korean vertically differentiated higher education system in which students compete for a place in prestigious institution, so-called the sky, uh, not paying much attention to discipline of their degree. Uh, in the end, uh, universities have less incentive to deviate from the demand of students and Korea suffer from a labor market mismatch, particularly the shortage of science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics graduates. He argues the horizontal differentiation system uh, remains viable option for meeting the needs of knowledge economy like in Germany. Uh, surely things get a bit better nowadays in Korea, but still the Korea and some East Asian countries are still largely maintaining the vertically hierarchical university system which has been even further strengthened by university ranking pressure. Um, the problem partly influenced from human capital depreciation. Um, Kaun Ban, uh, Ban Gaun in chapter nine uh, estimate human capital depreciation in OECD countries. Uh, there are two East Asian countries here, as you can see, Japan and Korea. Normally Japan and Korea are often regarded as similar welfare states. But in terms of labor market outcome, they are highly different. For example, skills depreciation rate after formal education is the highest in Korea, which means the more problematic and the lowest in Japan. Uh, according to Kaun, the problem can be found in the prevalence of low quality jobs, high hierarchical workplace culture with less autonomy and less discretion, plus lack of social investment on workers. So this is the problem. So then uh, what would be the strategy to upgrade social investment to overcome these problems? Uh, as you see, uh, we, are, we are all pessimist, uh, we're difficult, uh, but uh, let me say a few things re directly relate to the education and employment. Uh, first, probably uh, overall public responsibility in education should be expanded. Uh, you know, private financing is too much. So we can probably increase uh, the uh, public responsibility in education, but probably we shouldn't end there. Uh, second, we need a discussion how to weaken the idea of unhealthy meritocracy. Uh, meritocracy is, based, uh, is everywhere nowadays. In Korea, in political discourse, we call it a uh, fairness uh, discourse, the uh, gungjeong, meritocracy. Um, but, uh, you know, the, this, this is the, um, the key goal of our education system is still to pick a winner on the hierarchical university system, not seriously thinking of, of uh, different talents young people have, or even labor market demands. And uh, winners pretty much go inside the smaller inner circle of the labor market and the, re the rest go to the outer circle. As uh, Michael Sandel said here, uh, the merit meritocrat ideal can be a justification of inequality rather than a remedy for inequality. We also need a better uh, lifelong education and job training program, surely. Um, it's always easier said than done because you need more knowledge and skills nowadays to get a decent job. You need a probably a longer, higher quality education and training to get a decent job after your first career but it's always difficult for the government uh, under physical pressure. We need more ideas about this. Definitely we need more discussion, but as Gaon describes, we also need to change a hierarchical workplace culture without much workers autonomy. But this is something very difficult to tackle by the government in the liberal economy. Uh, you know, government is difficult to say, you know, do this, do that to the companies. Yeah, one of the reasons is the, uh, another probably reason is the low level of decommodification and low level of social protection. Uh, better and thicker social protection could increase workers' autonomy, probably decrease their uncertainty a bit more. Also a few chapters, including mine and Jaeyoung chapter, uh, chapter eight, uh, who uh, examined the Matthew effect. Uh, we also emphasize the role of social protection for better social investment. It helps children and low income people get proper education and training under the stable environment, which could reduce Matthew effect as well. 
As John Dewey said in 1935, a long time ago, uh, he said the insecurity is not, a, not, it's not the, uh, the motive to work and sacrifice, but to despair. I, I agree. Uh, and is this what he said is still very relevant uh, nowadays. The finally, um, we need the social protection, social investment, and social innovation probably to promote entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, which can produce more quality employers in the end, produce more quality jobs. More than 70% of secondary students go to university nowadays in Korea, but good jobs are around, we said around 20% or 30% in the labor market. This is a huge mismatch, but a few people want to be a good employer. Uh, everybody want to be a good employees rather than they want to be a good employer. Nobody wants to create a jobs, they want to get a stable jobs. Uh, this is, I think this is a, the big problem. Uh, there's ample evidence Korean young people are afraid of failure and pursue stability and security instead of doing what they want to. For example, public sector employees and medical doctors are most favored by young people, not really because they want to, where they can do well, but because these jobs give you security and certainty throughout your life. Uh, surely we need a specific policy to promote entrepreneurship, but in the end, building a better welfare state in which young people are willing to take the risk is the way to create more employers and more quality jobs. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so that's uh, our kind of um, idea about this book and some of the, uh, you know, the summary and key feature of the, the book. Uh, do you have any uh, question, comments, please? And if you, you can leave your question in the chatting room, uh, what I can see from chatting room is only the promotion, uh, the 50% of discount, but okay, uh, that's not a question. Um, anybody want to say something about the book or your question about from the uh, presentations? Okay, Antonius? Yeah, I mean, just to say a big thank you. I mean, it's a really interesting book. And I think uh, one of the things I particularly enjoy is the angles you have used. And I mean, I think particularly the focus on private education for me and the sort of the private aspects I, I find is fascinating. And the reason I find it fascinating is because, uh, I mean, I, my work focuses a lot on the family. And the, one of the key actors, and it's not just a welfare actor, I think it's also an economic actor, is the family. And the family both receives welfare, but also spends welfare, whether it is educational purposes, creating, or even for protecting its members. And one of the things that I find really interesting here is that the role of the family has been playing a very important role. And at the same time, I mean, it seems like it's, being exhausted. It seems like there's already a lot of insecurity. It seems like the governments, the employers, either by negligence or by intention, they keep pushing a lot of those responsibilities back to the family. And the, the family has gender hierarchies. And this is where I think gender also becomes a real issue. So my question is more about the future of social investment. And one of the questions I would suggest in a sense is for me, the book manages to sort of deliver a lot of the kind of case studies and the nation states. And my question would be, using the last example you mentioned, Yingchun, about doctors and having a lot of doctors, one of the examples of what happened during the crisis back in Greece and Italy, Spain and Portugal 10 years ago, there was a massive migration of doctors, about 25,000 of them going to places like Germany or the UK. So one of the interesting aspects I would like to put in the conversation, it's not, a, it's not a question really, it's more like your views perhaps, just to open a debate about the next steps, uh, next project perhaps, next book, I don't know, but it's that transnational dimension. So yeah. how far is there a risk here that you're gonna have people being educated in getting very highly you know, trained, if you want skills, but then they will have to migrate somewhere else because the labor market could not absorb them. So that transnational dimension for me is very important, given that a lot of us here might have been educated in different places than we actually work. Uh, so, or at least our first degrees or whatever. 
we all travel a bit. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that is my question really coming out from, you know, as an next perhaps challenge and how that comes into play. Okay, well, thank you so much, Antonio. That's a very important uh, dimension. We haven't really, uh, you know, dealt with in our book, but I think this transnational kind of a migrations uh, and social investment would be a, quite a, a big topic. Uh, anybody or any authors uh, who want to respond to uh, give a thought? Well, I could, I think, um, well, as an economic migrant myself um, in, in the UK, um, it is an issue if um, from an effectiveness point of view for, for government, of course, if, um, if you pursue kind of supply side of, of social investment, poor, poor into the younger generation, and then your economy isn't able to provide adequate jobs that really addresses the desire for security we, we see, or many of us seem to have, then you do possibly migrate. And that, of course, would undermine um, um, well, government spending. And it's, of course, the question is whether then in the future government might withdraw certain social investment. And you could wonder whether then, for instance, in higher education, whether government will, in, in many more places, would want to have a private contribution towards tuition, for instance. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, but what I think your 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 um, your intervention highlight is the issue of um, well, what sort of policy mix do we actually need to create more egalitarian um, societies? And that here, certainly the social protection dimension, so the securing of old social risks need to still feature prominently, and one shouldn't trade new against old social risks, but also. What we tried in our in the first pitch, labor market regulation, of course, an issue we in social policy are a little bit uncomfortable with. It's more the kind of industrial relations people. But I think for um, for us in social policy, looking at the regulation of labor market and the importance for creating decent, secure jobs, that might be something we we have to explore um, more and get out of our comfort zones of social insurances, social services, but actually get into the, into the workplace or um, as a field of study, engage more with neighboring disciplines, with um, colleagues in human resources management who coming from an industrial relations background and um, who possibly could help us to, to design better policies, but without the regulation side, creating good jobs like um, like Young Jun highlighted, if you have 70% going to university with the desire to get a decent job and there are only 20 to 30%, um, that's pretty depressing and not meeting people's aspiration. Yeah, if I can jump in quite quickly, Antonio, thank you so much for your um, feedback and comment. I just want to reiterate the last point Timo mentioned, the importance of labor market institutions not just labor market policy, but institutions and workplace um, practices and culture. I mean, really in us, academics and people who want to become academic. And anecdotal evidence, we all know that if we tend to see people who migrate, so migrate to a different country, whether you have done PhD in a different country or whether you pursue a job in a country other than your motherland, it's often driven by the desire to have secure job in all your stage tenure. And especially also for women, it is important to be able to combine your work and family responsibility better. For instance, you might have faced a lot of East Asian uh, female academics wanting to <laughs> establish a career in European countries rather than going back to Korea where you have long work hours and a lot of work-related responsibility, which are not exactly on your job contract. So I think, once again, the importance of integrating labor market policy and integrations um, 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 institutions in the policy mix and in designing social investment strategies. Great. I, I think the, this talk, yes, Ijin, please. Um, I'm sorry, maybe I can be repetitive a little bit because actually both Timo and Suyan were saying that the labor market is important and this is also what I want to say too. But uh, I wanted to somehow put this into perspective in a sense that uh, uh, you know, like uh, all of us know that uh, the social investment perspective is very much meant like the book from Costa Espinandes and Miles uh, from 2002 is meant to be some kind of a solution for the problems of sustainability of the welfare state. So they're saying, okay, let's invest more on people. 
let's make them uh, to have an easier work family reconciliation. Let's invest on the active labor market policies. But it's a little bit like uh, it looks like it's a fault of the individual and not the problem of labor market, the job places, availability. However, as, as you can also see from our, our chapter, like you can put two extreme examples, like the case of Italy and the case of South Korea. If you look at human capital, like in terms of education levels of women in Korea and Italy, Korean women are very educated, very highly educated. Italian women are not enough highly educated. So we have two opposites, but what do they do? They emigrate. Look at my case. I'm Italian and Korean too, and I emigrated still, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I think that this is very indicative to show that uh, the individual can try as much to increase skills, to increase education, but at the end of the day, for a sustainable social investment strategy, everything boils down to having good jobs and uh, a functioning labor market. And this is a perspective that I think should be added more in social investment discourses. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Shijin, the very good com the, the response. And also, uh, when we look at the East Asian perspective, uh, you know, the, the brain draining actually happening a lot in Philippines, and that's a kind of long-term uh, issue in India and Philippines, and they're kind of a, got a good education, and they mostly migrate uh, to other countries. But this is not only kind of international dimension, but also the, the domestic, the internal migration is a serious issue. Uh, I had a meeting with a kind of a local province a few days ago, and you know, young people just all migrate to Seoul and Gyeonggi province. Uh, and, and also probably this is not only the problem in uh, Korea, probably also in China, uh, the, the internal migration to the, the big cities and, and they don't know what to do. They still try to build up, you know, the roads and, you know, more like investing the SOC rather than actually the, the human or the, the labor market properly. Uh, so, but it, it's a difficult, you know, difficult task to say what to do actually to them. However, I think that this should be our kind of a, one of the probably next project, next agenda. Uh, about you know the uh, making your village uh, proper <laughs> and so on, something like that. Yeah. Uh, any other question, comments, or any reflection from the authors? Dan Lee has a sent up an electronic hand. Dan Lee, your oh, hand is up. Yeah. Oh yes. yeah, yeah. Please. Oh yes. Oh uh, yeah. So thanks for all the presenters, authors of the book. It seems super interesting. And maybe I not maybe definitely I should buy this book after this session. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I have a lot to say about like education system because uh, I am one of that person who grew up in the Techi Pro Techi Dong <laughs> region, uh, which is the center of shadow education. And I'm also uh young male in the age 20s who was the super advocate group of uh, the meritocracy argument. And I, th I think this meritocracy is usually discussed as uh, the trade-off between like fairness and inequality. But uh, my own view is that maybe we should uh, switch the discourse into um, efficiency arguments. So, I mean, young male people are are super advocate of yeah meritocracy and I, I think to persuade them efficiency argument will be quite strong because uh, what I found in my own ex personal experience is that this examination based education system is very inefficient I mean it's revealed in the presentation those data that employers don't aren't aren't really satisfied with highly educated people's skills because th that's because we're super obsessed with examination and we interpret that as like a, a we, we demand kind of um, compensation after getting a good score in, in examination. So we're not really focusing on the real skills needed in the labor market. For example, like young people seeking jobs in the labor market, they're preparing for TOEIC exam, which is completely unused in, in the labor market. So that kind of exam culture and ranking people by exam is really not really matching the labor market uh, skills demand. And also uh, I think that's one way of um, 
uh, solving the problem, people just seeking security, but yeah, we need to pursue more innovation and, and job creation like startup. I think the changing that paradigm of education from yeah, the exam based to more like yeah, critical thinking or like, like more qualitative examination would be more efficient in the long run as like social investment and labor market uh, facilitation strategy. And um, another, I, I have another question to specifically to Professor Yi Jin Hong. Uh, I, I think the female employment uh, problem in all the, in, in both Korea and Japan, maybe in, in Spain and Italy, yeah, would be the re-entering problem of, re-entering in the labor market problem of, of um, mothers, young mothers. And uh, yeah, it's very puzzling to, to see why Korea has invested a lot, but we cannot, we're not really observing increase in female employment, but yeah, paradoxically, Japan has experienced a lot increase in female employment. And maybe, I, I, I guess we, we need to then observe the the preference of women maybe there is a difference of self selection not just institutional constraint but yeah select self selection of uh, women in in japan and korea so korean women would be more career oriented than japanese women so they won't accept the part time jobs or secondary jobs so like yeah there's more kind of competition and struggle in, in korea so that's leading to more dualization and inequality whereas in japan like even highly educated women quite accept and prefer like secondary jobs, part-time jobs. So I, I yeah, maybe I, I think there's kind of yeah difference of preference of women playing the role there. And for for myself, promotion, I mean I, I was quite surprised that like Professor Yi Jin Hong's research is very similar to my own research, which will be presented tomorrow in the first <laughs> session of gender inequality. So yeah, please, this is my self promotion promotion. So please yeah, come everyone who's interested and please provide good comments and suggestions tomorrow. Thank you very much, Gun. Uh, excellent comment and also uh, the question. Uh, so um, we, the time is a little bit run over, but uh, I'll, I'll give about one minute to each author to give any kind of thought on uh, guns and other kind of a, you know, a response uh, about um, can I uh, very quickly yeah. respond? Um, I'm not Professor Yusin Hong, but um, actually I was responsible for the case of Japan. So um, actually comparing Japan and Korea is super interesting because they are very similar in terms of many things like shadow education. And also, um, as I grew up in Japan, I am familiar with their, you know, examination and um, very, it's, that's, that culture is very similar to Korea. So actually it's interesting that um, employer satisfaction about um, high, um, high skills employee is very different in Korea and Japan. That's very interesting. So I don't think it is the matter of the, the system, but it could be um, result from the labor market characteristics. And this is also related to the, the second part of Gon's uh, question about um, women's um, preference about their, their, their career. Um, I don't think it is related to their um, proficiency, rather that um, it is more related to um, job availability in the labor market. Um, in Japan, for example, the percentage of part-time employment to full-time female employment in 2020 was 50%. So it's, it's super high um, comparing other countries of like Korea, um, Spain, and Italy. And especially it was super low in Korea because it was only 18%. So it means Korean women um, did not choose to work as part-time job because they didn't want, rather it's because they couldn't find it. So I don't, um, I'm not saying part-time job is the best way to solve the problem in the labor market, but uh, it can be explain the increase in female employment in Japan as their um, part-time job availability has been improved a lot for the last 20 years. Okay, um, 
Thank you very much, Jin. A final remark, uh, shortly, uh, Ijin and Timo, Sion, Sonia, please. Uh, yes, uh, if I can build up on what Jin said, Kunli uh, Ikun, right? I think that uh, it's great that the young Korean male is doing gender studies. So please do more of that. We want to have more perspectives on this. Um, I think that actually what you raised is more like a hypothesis, right? In a sense that what we are stating is that by comparing four countries, we are implying that availability in the labor market can uh, be an explaining factor. But there are some contrasting explanations, right? For example, when we are looking at um, survey uh, average scores from uh, international surveys, Japan always comes out consistently as very conservative. So even for women, so there is definitely some kind of intersection with the preference. I'm sure that this is not a negligible factor, but there are, for example, scholars like Professor Konsumi, she wrote a paper that is called, do Japanese women prefer part-time job, part job because of the preference? And her answer is no, out of an institutional analysis. She thinks that, as Chiyun said, this is out of uh, availability of uh, part-time jobs. So this is actually something that deserves more discussions. You're very welcome to do this. And uh, it's very good to hear that you're doing this research. If I can, I will enter your session, but I also have to at attend another session. So, but let's keep in touch. Okay, uh, so yes, tomorrow's will... session will be uh, crowded. <laughs> 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 Sonia? And just, just quickly, I just want to say okay. thank you everyone for joining us. And then just one thing, um, this collaboration has been really enjoyable experience, both personally and intellectually. So I really want to uh, promote one way to promote East Asian social policy. The scholarship of it is really um, promoting more comparative study between East Asia and other regions of the world, Europe and other regions of the world. And I really, really, it's good to see known East Asians participating in ESSP conference every time. So I would like to see more of um, more co collaborations of some sort of comparing different regions and East Asia. Okay, so Sonia and Timo, yeah. I've talked I, I enough, have, just John, Sonia. I have nothing further substantive to add other than to tell you all to buy the book. <laughs> so to <laughs> just, you can be all to buy the book. It's been a super interesting collective endeavor and I've been very glad to be part of it. So um, yeah, no, I, I have nothing further to add intellectually. I think I'm... <laughs> yes, Timo, any... Well, maybe a non-academic thing. Of course, one perk of these sort of collaborations is um, with, in different parts of the world that you get, get different types of food all the time. <laughs> and of course, um, I think that is a, is a nice perk you, one should keep in mind. So everybody who wants to do interregional comparative research um, 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 should be aware of the risk of temporarily putting on some, some weight. Um, but yeah, it was very enjoyable and um, I hope if anybody in the audience has questions or comments afterwards, um, drop us a line. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Uh, I particularly thank to uh, Timo Sion uh, working so hard for this volume and also all the contributors. And also there are some of my uh, assistants used to be uh, my students, but now like Professor Mison and Wani Hesang, they're all kind of helping this project a lot uh, in the behind the mm -hmm. scenes. So uh, thank you so much for the everything uh, you did for the book. And thank you for coming this session. So, um, and we probably have another book launching seminar at the SBA conference, but, uh, but thank you for coming. And we have uh, the uh, spatial chat area if you want to have an informal chat with us, uh, you can directly come to special chat in the in chatting room. Uh, you can find it. Then uh, bring uh, your drink, get your drink, and uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, bye bye. Thank you. So